How are you all? It's always a tough session everywhere. It's always a tough session after lunch, isn't it? You've had some carbohydrate and some of you have had some alcohol and all that sort of stuff. So that's the morning. That's the, that's the kind of morning over. That's like a quarter of the conference gone. <clears throat> Wasn't. So a couple of, couple of points. I thought Alan Farrington in that last discussion was simply stunning. I thought he was a Scottish Jeff Booth. In terms of his intellect, every word he says, every utterance has meaning behind it. And I just thought, wow, 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 wow. So when you think about the future, you know, when I'm older and even more grey, I'm so glad that these, this, this is what's bubbling up in, in the Bitcoin community. So <clears throat> we've spoken to, we've spoken to the, the guests to make sure that they've got their, their uh, collar mics up as high as possible um, so that you can hear them. There's a couple of people saying that it was a bit difficult at the back, so we're, we're aware of that. I'm really sorry. I am really sorry that it's £2.50 for a coffee. Unfortunately, we were able to give you your first coffee for free. Um, that was three grand. Unfortunately, I don't have the budget to give you another free coffee today. But who knows, maybe in the next, in the next time we do it, we'll be able to have uh, more free uh, tea and coffee. But we do have, there's, there's plenty of water for you to keep you hydrated. The reason I'm up here just now is this next, this next panel is really uh, personal to me. So I went to a, a meeting in a big posh bank and that big Bosch bank was called Coots in Edinburgh, right? So I think they, they're the bankers for the rich. I was just, I was just, I was, a, I was the awful, right? I was the entertainment. So then I went and we had lunch and there was about 12 people there and a few sort of well-known sort of uh, multi-millionaire techie guys. And the guy at the top of the table was called Alan. And Alan introduced himself as he's the guy who's in charge of the billions under asset for Coots Bank. And he was sitting there, and he looks a wee bit like Robin Williams, and he was sitting there with his, his wee book, you know, and really very clever, clever guy, articulate, maths, finance. And he, you all go around the table and you say what you are, and I say, well, I'm into Bitcoin and la-di-da. He started the conversation, and I thought, he's going to be really boring. He's going to talk about numbers and banks and finance. And he started saying, talking about how he, he visited Venezuela and he had spoken to Galaxy Digital and he knew all about Bitcoin. And I said to him, so what's your thoughts on it all? And he said, the only one that's caught my eye, and this is a head of investment for Coots, is Bitcoin. And that was the moment I said, you need to come and speak. You need to come and speak to these people. So he's agreed to come today to speak and be on this panel. You probably won't get a banker or an investment banker to come to a Bitcoin conference unless they've got security with them. But this guy's come here today. So let's see if we can um, orange pill him in a, um, a really sweet way. The second guy that's on the panel today is a guy called James Priday. You might have seen P1 out there. There, they are um, financial advisors, and you're like, well, what are financial advisors doing at a Bitcoin conference? Well, him and his guys, he's got he's got a team of thirty. They're all Bitcoiners. They are mad Bitcoiners. They know it. They get it. They understand the whole sound money principle. So he's sponsored it. He's here with his team. But even better, he's also got billions under asset because he works on a platform for financial advisors. Who better to let these people know about Bitcoin and Bitcoin adoption and hard money than these kind of people? So that's why we've put this panel together. So, and of course, you've got Peter McCormack um, hosting it. So that's why I wanted to introduce one because it was quite personal to me. Cheers. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so to, in this panel, we're going to be talking about the institutional wall of money. Uh, I'm going to let the guests introduce themselves. So over to you. Uh, I'm James Priday, uh, P1 Investment Management, as Jim just explained. Yeah, we're not actually right, financial advisors, but we work with financial advisors just for clarity. Yeah, we do have a platform and work with a lot of advisors. 
Yeah, Manuel, um, I'm responsible for business development for Fidelity Digital Assets outside of the United States. Hello, good afternoon. Alan Higgins, I'm the Chief Investment Officer for Coots & Co. I'm going to start with Coots & Co. I'm so used to saying it, you know. Coots one of those mysterious banks that we hear about. Um, but talk, talk a little bit about private banking. I've had a lot of issues with high street banks who keep closing down my bank accounts just because I'm involved in Bitcoin. Can you explain the challenges that banks have? I think it's a really interesting area to get into with regards to essentially uh, the government outsourcing surveillance to the banks and the kind of regulatory things and all the pressures that you have to deal with as a bank. It's huge. It's huge because if we get it wrong, huge fines. So um, by way of example, I'm only going to tell you something that's in the public domain. Um, some of you may have followed the scandal, the Malaysian scandal, 1MBD. Um, huge fines. I think the guy, is it Josh Lowe or Joe, Joe, Joe Lowe? He made some interesting films as well with the money. He's still on the run. Anyway, um, as a matter of public record, because it's in the public record, um, Coots, the Swiss bank, we no longer have it, got, got involved. Just huge fines if you get it wrong. And that's just one example. Um, yeah, regulation is intense, which makes this space tricky because I'm telling you, it's just not clear what we, and we can and cannot do. I, I was talking to somebody the other day who works for a pretty good platform for digital assets, and he used to work for the FCA, and I tried to pin him down and say, what, what can we do? Can we put it in portfolios? Can we do it under advice? Well, I'm pretty sure we can't do it under advice. So, you know, and he used to work at the FCA. So um, it's, 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 it's really not clear at the moment. So the, the issue is a lack of clarity rather than regulation? No, so regulatory, so there is this, okay. We manage thousands of portfolios and potentially we could put it in portfolios. So, um, so far in our space, just one firm has, I'm sure most people know Ruffer, put, it, uh, put Bitcoin in the portfolio for a little bit. Um, they're very large, uh, successful uh, portfolio manager, but we have thousands of accounts. And uh, this, the word fiduciary was, was brought out earlier. So our job would be, firstly, you know, to, be, to be clear, when you work with an institution, firstly, you need to get at least half of the decision makers, by the way, I'm not the only one, you know, on board. That's tick one. Two, then how do you do it? Now, there's a reason why gold is in many portfolios. It's the ETF. So uh, it goes against what we talked about this morning, unfortunately. But it's pretty hard to put and, you know, physical gold in thousands and thousands of portfolios. In fact, practically impossible. You do it in some kind of derivative. The gold ETF has led to, especially when some of it is physically backed with, with gold in vaults, has led to, to, to kind of pretty widespread, including at Coots, putting, putting gold in portfolios. So there's, there's many, many issues. It is unclear on, on regulatory. On portfolios, it seems to be clear we could potentially do it. But without an ETF, it's super challenging. OK, we'll come back to the ETF. So Bitcoin itself is a, is a grassroots movement. It's a bottom-up movement. It, is, it, it, you know, it was created by Satoshi. It was uh, uh, promoted by the cypherpunks. It was adopted by the libertarians. But it is essentially a grassroots movement. And we're here to talk about an institutional wall of money. So uh, I'll start, Alan. Should people really care about institutional wall of money? Uh, as, a, as an individual investor in Bitcoin, it sounds great. I mean, this institutional wall of money could you know, uh, increase the net wealth of the people in this room. But is it good for Bitcoin? Is that for me? Yep. Whether it's good for Bitcoin is difficult to say. I mean, I suppose just, just to look at the data, right, in just, this is just the UK, most people don't have much cash savings. So I think the average in the UK is about £12,500, but that that varies between age groups, and obviously it, it, it varies quite massively, but a lot of people don't have that many much money to deploy into an asset like that. Um, what people do have, the average size of a pension scheme in the UK, an individual pension scheme, is about £60,000. There's about five times more um, wealth within pension schemes that's potentially available to invest than people have cash in their bank. So in terms of accessibility and giving people an access and exposure to the price of Bitcoin, it does make a lot of sense that pension schemes can access it and can hold it for people because that's generally where they've got a lot of their wealth apart from property. 
What is the barrier for pension schemes allowing this? Well, unfortunately, it's going back to what, what uh, Alan said. It's, it's, it's accessibility um, through a regulated vehicle like a spot Bitcoin ETF. I mean, as soon as a spot Bitcoin ETF comes along, you will start seeing absolutely people starting to allocate it within their portfolios. Probably smaller firms like us, probably initially, because, you know, we can make decisions and we can put it in without too much sort of, you know, nationwide sort of uh, risk, or global risk or whatever. Um, but it's going to be a massively important thing. That's the only way you can provide access. Apart from, I mean, we do run a portfolio. The best thing now, you could, you know, maybe buy some MicroStrategy shares. So you're going to get relative beta of Bitcoin. Um, Which is kind of an ETF. It is to an extent. Operates I think like that's what Michael Saylor's done. He's nearly created himself an ETF um, via MicroStrategy. Right, and everyone in the, um, people who don't know here, but in the US, everybody is looking towards Gary Gensler with regards to uh, the SEC eventually approving an ETF. He seems to be holding back for whatever reason, but there are ETFs, I, I believe there's one in Canada, I'm sure I've heard about one in Sweden, maybe there's one in Brazil, but I've heard about a few. Um, what are the barriers in the UK to an ETF? I, I, to be honest, I think we generally look towards the, the US first. So until yeah. there's a spot Bitcoin ETF uh, approved uh, by the SEC, I don't think there's going to be one approved in the UK. I could be wrong, but that's my view. So Fidelity, obviously a very well-known and very respected company, especially within the Bitcoin space, started in mining, I believe. Uh, yeah, we, we started, we started the, uh, our, our sort of foray into the space really as a sort of R&D initiative in, in 2014. Uh, part of that was, was mining, but it was really... Um, it was really to, to be able to understand, to your point, it's a grassroots movement, right? So the only way to really understand the technology, we thought at the time, and I, and I, think, you know, I think it was the right call, was, was to have developers, to have miners, et cetera, so that you could embed yourself in the community and understand it better. Um, and I think the reason I think it was the right call is that, you know, we're the first large financial institution to kind of have then a, a sort of client-facing product offering uh, in this space, and I think you can only really do that, and that was 2018, right? So between 2014 and 2018, that's four years of research until we kind of got comfortable with, with the space. Because um, of you know, what Alan said, you know, there's, there's many decision makers in, in those rooms, right? Until everybody gets comfortable, you need to, you need to really know what you're doing. And, and one of the good ways of doing that is, is being involved in mining. And what kind of services do Fidelity now provide for? Because I know as a company, you have trillions under management, yeah, yeah, millions it's, it's of trades a, big, a day. Yeah, it's a pretty big group. But so what, what, what uh, services and facilities are you providing to to both retail and institutional customers. Yeah, so, so at the moment it's only uh, it's only institutional, right? Okay. So um, so we, we we started there. We're constantly sort of you know looking around uh, the company, looking at our sort of clients' needs to, to see what we what we provide next. Uh, but at the moment institutional only. Um, so we do we started with custody, right? This was again because of that historical reason of you know where we started in this R and D unit, um, our timing, right? Because at the time, if you think about 2014, 2015. There really wasn't much in terms of institutional custody in the market, um, and Can, so just just for people yeah. to understand, explain what custody is and, that, and why fair, you would fair. provide it. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so custody, you know, in in a sort of traditional sense, right, comes from the fact that you know when when you used to have a a stock or a share in the old days, you'd have a custodian bank that literally kept a piece of paper uh, with your name saying saying that you own those those shares, right? Um, the concept in in Bitcoin. Is, is not too different. So, but but it's private keys instead of instead of sort of certi shared certificates, right? And that's that's kind of what we do. Um, in in some ways, it's very different and technologically more advanced. But in, in other ways, it's similar, right? Like there's there's vaults uh, and there's sort of you know people involved with with securing those vaults. So so that's what we mean by by custody. And what other services are you providing for institutions? Yeah. So so you also provide execution. So the, the first uh, execution is the ability to trade. So. Um, that was feedback that we got from our clients pretty quickly, right? So it's, okay, you can now secure my Bitcoin, very happy with that, but if, you, you know, if you're forcing me to take my Bitcoin in and out in order to trade and access the market, it sort of defeats some of the purpose, right, and some of the operational risk that they're trying to, to mitigate as an institution. So the first thing we did was uh, we built the ability of them to trade directly from, from our cold storage. Uh, we obviously need to manage those movements, but we sort of take on that, that operation uh, ourselves. Um, and then on top of that, we're, we're now doing sort of collateral services. So this, the idea that, you know, you might have Bitcoin, um, you might have, a, not all investors do have a directional sort of view on Bitcoin, by the way, but, but if you were somebody in this room and you had some Bitcoin with us, you probably want to keep it, you don't want to sell it. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't use it, right? So you should be able to use it as collateral to raise funds for, for other things. Um, and so we offer, we offer that service as well in a, in a tripartite way. So 
we connect lenders that might lend dollars to somebody who's got Bitcoin um, that wants to collateralize a, a loan with, those, with, with their Bitcoin. And we as Bitcoiners, we're encouraged to be self-sovereign. We're encouraged to hold our own keys. Uh, some of us will be trading as well. But why is it that institutions wouldn't do that? Is it a regulatory reason? Or is it a security yeah. reason? Is it operational reason? I, I, I think probably, probably a mix of, of all of those, right? So um, from a security and sort of risk perspective, uh, if you're an institution, a lot of the time, you, you know, you're managing money that it's not your own, um, or it might be sort of your company's. And so to take on the, the operational complexity and the risk uh, of a bearer asset, it, it, it can get you know, it can get very, very expensive, very risky, it can, it can go wrong, right? We all know of, of stories that people lost their private keys, et cetera. If you're, if you're having, managing clients' money, uh, you have to be a little bit more careful than that, right? Um, and so, you know, as, as you probably know, Peter, right? Like, to, to get good with um, self-custody, it, it gets a little bit complex. You have to have sort of different signatories in hopefully geographically dispersed places, et cetera. And so outsourcing some of that to an institution that specializes in, in doing that and already had, you know, seven plus decades of, um, of history as a you know, financial services provider um, makes sense. So, so that's kind of the um, operational risk complexity. Um, sometimes if you're managing money on behalf of somebody else, you have to get a third party custodian anyway, right? So and this has to do really with segregation of duty. So if somebody's managing your money, you wanna make sure that somebody else is keeping it just, just to kind of have the two functions um, operate independently. Um, and, and so that, that might be sort of a, a regulatory obligation as well. Moving back over to Coots, um, obviously you're here, which is great, thank you for coming. Um, the interest that Coots has in, business, in Bitcoin, is that being customer-led? Do you have customers coming to you asking, or is it being Coots-led in that you're recognizing that there is this revolution happening and that Coots needs to become part of this? A bit of both. To be fair, it's a minority of our customers are coming and saying, we want the safety uh, of having a good custodian to, to trade to, uh, crypto in general, but especially Bitcoin, and for us. But I would say, uh, it, we, we talked about the hurdles. One of the other hurdles we haven't talked about, there is interest in it, but we want, we're really looking for uncorrelated assets, and gold previously has been relatively uncorrelated. One of the more troubling aspects of Bitcoin more recently, as everyone knows, it's become very correlated with the stock market, especially NASDAQ. So bizarrely, what we'd be looking for, so for example, next year, you know, a, uh, NASDAQ up 30%, Bitcoin down three, that gets us actually quite interested. Cause, because it's very easy Not to buy us. stocks. No, but it's very, it's can, super, can, yeah. But can it's we have NASDAQ down 30 and yeah, Bitcoin up three? Yeah, well, it's, yeah, that's also, but that's, that's the point. That can happen in the next year yes. or the next period. The point being, it's very easy to build a stock, a bond, gold portfolio to a certain extent, very, very easy. It's very hard to get something that's different from stocks. Right. That's our problem, very, very hard. Uh, and the, the, you know, gold is a physical belief system, as we know. I know you, you, you express that to, to fiat as well, but gold certainly is. Uh, Bitcoin's potentially a digital belief system. I say potentially, representing the fiat side. Uh, but you know, some, some of us are willing to, to embrace that. Mm. But if it performs in line with stocks, like stocks, it's of no use to us. It needs to perform differently, to be uncorrelated. So. When you're servicing your customers, the kind of customers that you have that come to you, what, are they looking for you to uh, manage their portfolio for them? Or similar to Fidelity, are they looking to you to just provide services and execute trades? So we're a bank, and we do have a, a, a dealing arm. But the main thing we do is discretionary portfolio management. Um, you know, didn't someone on the Euro Millions in Scotland win 190 million or something? You know, that person you know, after having some fun, might want to invest 150 million a bit. They come to a bank like Coots and say, how would you invest 150 million? And we show them all kinds of fiat stuff. Um, <laughs> and and, and, and your know, portfolio gets made. Um, but the point being is that, look, um, you know, we won't have an argument about stocks for the long run, but uh, we're a big advocate for stocks for the long run, but we're also big advocates of, is there anything that hedges or if, 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 or if the other alternative is, if, if Bitcoin's going to compete with stocks, it's, it better be as good as Apple or Amazon, right? Mm -hmm. So it's either going to be moving in line with stocks, it's got to be a great stock then, or it's uncorrelated. We'd prefer it to be uncorrelated. 
we're, we're waiting for the evidence because we want uncorrelated assets. So you're purely interested in the asset, not the mission? Yeah, that's because that's, that's, that's our fiduciary, our fiduciary responsibility is that clients come to us and say, please manage our money. Uh, and, and therefore, we are, we are open-minded. We look to farm the financial markets. Obviously, the simplest way of farming the financial markets, a bunch of stocks, a bunch of bonds, and maybe some gold. But we've done some more esoteric stuff, which is for another conference. And, and therefore, you know, crypto is in, <coughs> in research. Sorry, what was that word? <laughs> From a fiat perspective. Uh, so, so, so we're in, we're in research perspective, but you know, I'm, it, it, it's, it's, you know, um, it's not helpful that, to us that, that Bitcoin performs like stocks. We don't, that's what we don't want. And does Coots operate a node? Does Coots operate, sorry? A node, a Bitcoin node. No, no, no nothing yet. No. <laughs> I've just pulled it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. Okay, so this institutional wall of money, again, I, it's, it's a term I, I've struggled with. Um, yeah. some, again, sometimes you can become excited about things because you just think selfishly about what, what that would mean for me. But we have had uh, an institutional singular wall of money come from Michael Saylor into Bitcoin, and we've had some other interest elsewhere. Now, it, does the institutional wall, wall of money actually exist and we're not seeing it? What, what is actually going on with institutions behind the door? Well, I think what people sort of forget with institutions is the institutions are us, by the way, because it's all your money and pension schemes and all that sort of stuff. So people forget about it. They're talking about it like these big companies and that sort of stuff with these big asset managers. It, it's all of your money here. So uh, the flow actually comes from retail demand, um, or at least I believe it is. I mean, in the UK, you know, financial advisors do actually drive the flow of assets um, to a much greater extent than people probably realise. About 1.4 trillion is looked after by financial advisors in the UK. So the demand comes when you've got clients that are interested in it, that want to speak to it. Then you've got a financial advisor going to a Fidelity or whatever, because they're wanting a, uh, an investment product that they can advise a client to invest into. So I think there is an institutional wall of money coming. Um, it's just getting to the point of either asset allocation, uh, so portfolio managers doing asset allocation, so like what Alan's talking about, where actually you suddenly look at it and it's actually something that can add value to a portfolio, so then they look for a way to, to, to offer it. So you've got that sort of driver of an institutional wall of money. But it's also, as I mean, this sort of conference, I mean, you get a ripple effect from it. You get more and more people starting to understand it, more and more people wanting to speak to a financial advisor or an investment manager about it, and that's the stuff that drives the institutional wall of money. So the institutional wall of money still comes from retail via financial advisors into, the, into your kind of institutions as well? I, 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 I believe so. I mean, there's, uh, I mean financial advisors, 1.4 trillion. I mean, that, that's a big chunk of assets in the UK. Three and a half trillions in UK-based pension funds. So these are all of your guys' pension funds. So it's when everybody on the street starts taking an interest and starts understanding this that you start getting a demand driver. Then the institutions get themselves into a position to actually offer things in the market. And um, Manuel, what what type of customers uh, customers are these? Most of the people in here we would expect to be able to buy their own Bitcoin, hold their private keys, you know, have a hardware wallet. But I also know there's people like my dad who can barely operate a remote control. And so the idea of him managing his private keys, it scares me. But at the same time, he might, might want portfolio allocation to Bitcoin. Is this who you're servicing? Not for the time being, right? So I think for I know the you're time not a retail, being, but the, these yeah. are... Is, yeah, so, so ultimately, ultimately I, I agree with James, right? Like yeah. you kind of have two ultimate sources of, of, of money, right? It will be individuals or it will be corporations. Those are kind of the... The sort of the, the origin of it. Um, so, so we at the moment uh, service a lot of intermediaries. Um, we also do, by the way, you know, about the, the sort of wall of money, whether it's there or not. So we, so we do we do research around this, right? So we we build a business around it. So we need to know if we're kind of heading in the right direction or or not, right? Um, and so in, in a kind of factual way. So so we every year for the past three years we get an independent um, research provider to go and do a survey of institutional investors. And this is everything, right? From right all the way from family offices to sort of corporations that would include sort of a, a Tesla or a MicroStrategy or something. Um, and and that data is is has been really encouraging, right? So so my answer would be yes, the wall of money is there, right? It might just be that it's very much in exploratory mode with with small allocations. But if you look at the numbers, I mean, in Europe alone, I think it was just less than half in 2020. Last year, it was 56% of investors said yes, we have some sort of exposure to. Digital assets, uh, what? <laughs> maybe not Bitcoin, 
digital assets. Um, but in, in Asia, for example, it was 71 percent. Okay. Right. So that's that's a majority that, that you've got there. Um, and so so we see we see some of these some of these moves um, ourselves. Um, and then and then yes, hopefully that means that as you get these intermediaries and as you get these various types of institutions in the market, it becomes more easy, you know, easier for, for you know, your dad uh, to, to go and invest in, in Bitcoin. There's, there's also a need to, you know, to frankly um, have, you know, have a bit more clarity for, for those institutions to be able to develop their products in a, in a kind of confident way. And what reservations are some of these companies having? And what, kind, what are the kind of questions that people are coming to you with? Yeah. Um, it, it really varies, right? So, so you know, one of the reasons that we're kind of here today is that we, you know, we invest a lot in education. So all of our research is sort of free and, and public, um, and that's really very much part of, 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 of we see ourselves as part of kind of uh, growing the, the ecosystem. Um, and, you know, and I spend a lot of my time, you know, I'm, I'm meant to be sort of selling our services, but I actually probably spend about half, if not more, of my time doing education. Right, and all the way to, and, and you'd be surprised, right, that some, some institutions that are relatively sophisticated in sort of traditional finance um, still come to us with relatively basic questions of, you know, what's Bitcoin, what's the blockchain. Um, that thankfully is getting less common, right? I think a lot of the, a lot of institutions have now hired sort of teams um, that go and study this stuff. Um, I think demographics, frankly, have a little bit of a part to play um, because, you know, I think the younger generation who is now kind of coming into coming into work and starting to to understand and have the power to make decisions uh, has less of a problem with something that is purely digital having value, right? Which is which is a very difficult thing to crack. Um, it, it's purely sort of on logic. You, you know, to Alan's point, Bitcoin should be no different from gold, right? Um, if if anything, has got better properties, right? But it's difficult for for people, particularly in older generations, to understand that something's got value without, without touching it. Um, I think with the younger generations, you see a lot more of that mindset shift, and so people are just more open-minded. So the questions are getting better, and it's more getting more about, you know, what's the investment thesis, right? So people stop worrying so much about the technology, but more about what, what it can achieve. And, that, and that's certainly a positive and a, and a, a sign of, of maturation, I think. And it's one of the primary challenges, uh, the volatility. It is, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, 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 it's very often quoted. I, I think in it's sort of this institutional study that we did last year, that was probably the most, uh, the most quoted reason uh, for people being skeptical of allocating more or, or allocating in the first place. Um, what, what I'd say is, I mean, volatility, for one, is kind of part and parcel of a, of a system that is, uh, that, that has sort of, that is scarce, tr truly scarce, right? Um, you don't have a central bank kind of you know, helping sort of tame some of the, the volatility, and so it's volatile. It's, it's sort of pure capitalism in, in, in some sense. Um, but, but one thing that is interesting is, you know, and, and for some investors, that volatility can be, can be quite scary. Um, but that's if you're thinking about, you know, if you're a corporation, you're putting part of your balance sheet into Bitcoin, then yes, it, it can be a little bit scary, and it, and it can be, you know, in the current, in the, in the current kind of market, it, it, can, it can sort of leave you with some trouble. Um, but you've got a kind of one way of dealing with it, which is just adjust the size of reallocation, right? Um, and we've, we've done some research on this around, you know, how including a little bit of Bitcoin in a portfolio to a certain percentage actually really increased, historically has increased the, the returns of your portfolio without changing your sort of max drawdown too much or changing the volatility of the portfolio too much. Uh, and so you could play with it. You don't have to invest your entire savings into Bitcoin. You could invest one or two or three percent of them but you still sort of covered for the scenario of, of the upside. Um, the, the other piece I'd say is institutions a lot of the time don't have a directional view on any particular stock or bond or, or, or asset class. Um, a lot of the institutional use cases will come from sort of the development of the digital economy, right? So, you know, in traditional finance, um, you know, let, let's take coffee, for example. You've got a coffee producer um, in, in South America um, that hasn't produced a coffee yet, um, but has contracts to fulfill, right, with, let's say, Nespresso or, or somebody. Um, they will typically hedge that, that future exposure as they produce the coffee because they don't want to be, you know, agricultural commodities are also very volatile, right, so they don't want to be exposed to, 
um, to that price. And equally, Nespresso doesn't want to be exposed to the price of coffee that it needs to buy to continue producing for, for its customers. And hence, you know, futures come in or forwards come in. So that kind of market, you could, you could see, and you could see it sort of developing in, in the Bitcoin world as well. Um, but you could see that kind of scenario uh, popping up where you might have a utility company. And this would be, I think, a scenario that a lot of, a lot of us talk about and, and it would be very positive of utility companies setting up a mining operation next to a hydropower plant or, or you know, uh, solar panels, et cetera, to kind of help uh, make it more, more profitable. Um, if you have that kind of scenario, you know, BP or, or whoever doesn't want to be exposed to Bitcoin. So what it'll immediately do is just hedge out that volatility in the market and there'll be another side wanting to buy Bitcoin on, on the other side. And so, you know, volatility is something institutions have to manage in sort of everyday life. Uh, markets are volatile is kind of what it is. And so as institutions get more sophisticated, I think that will kind of just fall into place. Most of, most of it comes down to time horizon, right? Volatility, <laughs> it depends when you actually want to get access to use it in some manner. So volatility, short-term volatility is not that important if you're investing to maybe extract your capital in 10 or 15 or 20 years time. So people do get confused by volatility. They, people think volatility is risk. It's, it's, it's only risk when you're putting it in the context of the time horizon. Right, and these corporations or institutions coming in or these uh, maybe retail investors, you know, they've, they're taking a long time, time horizon. A pension essentially is something decades ahead. Yep. But is it the same for companies? Do companies, well, they, they probably got more sort of trading cash flow requirements, yeah. so, so they're probably looking to park something for a much shorter period of time, or to, you know, of course, unless you're Michael Shashti and it's your whole sort of future treasury hundred management. Years. Yeah, hundred years or whatever, yeah. yeah. So I, it, again, it all comes down to time horizon. I think the, the, the interesting question is if you're going to hold assets and you weren't going to sell them for, say, the next 15 or 20 years, for me personally, I think actually, I think institutions will start to look at it and think, well, actually, the opportunity cost of not owning an asset like Bitcoin is probably too high not to have at least a small position there, is my personal view. And Alan, with the people who are coming into you, um, are you seeing a maturing of the questions that are being asked? And uh, is it, are you also seeing uh, a kind of like change in the way people's perception of, uh, change in the people's perception of what Bitcoin is? To a certain extent, I mean, although they don't, they don't like the volatility, having said that, Interesting fact: uh, the UK ultra-long index linked gilt fell more than the <laughs> fell more than Oops. Bitcoin in the last couple of months. So there's volatility everywhere. Yeah, it's still a minority. Again, how people come to us, they come to us going to your father. He comes to us with his 10 million. He says, "Invest it," and uh, we have a set of guidelines. We put in the future. We're not doing this now. To be clear, in the future, we may put one or two percent into Bitcoin if we do. And we present to him, if it goes wrong, he says, why did you do that? So, we, you know, that's the fiduciary part. We have to have a well-argued reason why we're doing that. So that's, so you can see, the, the, uh, I mean, um, for, for this audience, less so, but uh, it was John Maynard Keynes who said, um, it's, you know, people don't like to fail unconventionally. And in our fiat world, you know, putting Bitcoin in the world, it, as it, when it, if it goes down, People will say, oh, it was obvious you shouldn't have done that. Certain people will. And there's, so it's, it's going to be tough, firstly, to get internal round. And the minority of clients who come to us and say, we, I really want to do it, there's still a minority for now. It's, it, it, it's, it's more coming from our side. But there's, 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 there's plenty of a, a initiatives looking at um, both, both uh, Bitcoin and, and the blockchain within the that West and Coots. Um, right, yeah. And so how, how do you as a company build up your knowledge base within the business? How do you build your own expertise around this? So, uh, yeah, coming to events like this this morning was great. Great macro stuff this morning. Um, re really enjoyed it. Um, and it is learning. And it was actually very interesting learning to the participants this morning. What turned, frankly, what turned me around was um, talking to people from emerging markets. When you realize how... You know, I'm going to say it as, as it is, they're getting the money into dollars easily with some vol of Bitcoin. It really is a store of value. It really opened my mind to, 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 to seeing the value. And then, of course, the analogy with gold is pretty, pretty clear. Um, but there's, you know, it, there's a lot of hurdles. For it to really, really take off, I go back to the ETF. It's got to be something, if it's not the ETF, it's got to be something like the ETF. So what have we bought before? We've bought the gold ETF. We've bought gold miners. We've bought gold certificates. 
So, you know, maybe there's something in the future in terms of Bitcoin certificates. Is there enough gold to back all the gold certificates? Uh, well, it's <laughs> a so good question. So, um, the, 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 the one we buy is backed by gold at HSBC. There's what, some ETFs have no gold yep. backing, but there is one ETFS uh, um, from ETFS, which is now merged, which has, uh, and you can go and inspect it. You can say, show me this gold at HSBC. Now, maybe <laughs> there's not enough gold there. It's a fair point, but look, um, yeah, we, we, it's, you can't put physical gold in portfolios. You just can't. You know, as much as we'd like to, that's cleaner. We can't. So it's either certificates or ETFs. So going back to Bitcoin, thousands of clients, it's either certificates or ETFs. Right, okay. Um, we're obviously in very challenging economic climate right now, um, especially here in the UK. The UK seems to be hit by everything, not only re uh, recessionary pressures, massive inflation, energy crisis. Um, it is quite a scary envir environment for a lot of people at the moment. It's impacting people's lives. Um, has the current economic environment changed the kind of inbound questions regarding Bitcoin? Have you seen any response to that? I suppose maybe I'm a bit biased because I've always I've been sort of personally in this space for a while. Now moving into it, sort of professionally, trying to offer something in the market. So I've naturally got a lot of people that are always asking me about it. So I'm probably I'm probably biased. To be honest, now I think the interesting thing now the the price is less frothy as it was back in November of last year. Is generally the questions you're getting. It's more people trying to understand the fundamentals, not just oh, as a speculative asset that's going to pump in price. So I think the quality of inquiry about Bitcoin has gone up massively now. The price has actually come back down off of those highs back in November last year. And I think people are starting to understand some of the stuff that Greg Foss and um, Lawrence Lepard earlier on was showing in terms of inflation and the levels of debt and QE. I think even the average person on the street is now understanding that how the hell does this all piece together? and are starting to question a little bit more about actually what does things look like in five or ten years' time if things continue to go on in the current environment. The same question to you, Memo. Yeah. Um, I, surprisingly, I think the number of inquiries has gone up, um, actually. So um, it, probably different reasons we'd have beside different client base, right? Um, but, you know, if you think about uh, it, it just seems to be quite calculated, right? Um, and I think a lot of institutions understand now, I think, I think in, in sort of a bull market, um, the, the sort of, sorry, crypto crowd um, seems sort of so far ahead in, in kind of their business models um, and, and in their sort of growth patterns that a lot of institutions, I think, had almost given up, right, or kind of, or didn't quite understand it. Um, I think with the, with the crash and a lot of sort of the, the risk that got sort of washed out over over the summer, particularly in, in the last but you know a little bit all over the place, but this last was particularly you know particularly badly hit. Um, I, I think it was kind of evident that actually it's a very emerging asset class, and so there's a lot of institutions that are going, oh, okay, this is actually probably a good time to go and build and understand this, like without having, you know, without having that pressure of a, of a bull market and without firefighting at all times. And so we've seen. I actually charted this because um, you know as part of my job, I have to figure out. How, how our sort of sales efforts are going. And, and so I charted, and, and, and the theory was that our sales inquiries, so like people coming to us inbound kind of inquiries, uh, was quite highly correlated with the price of Bitcoin. And it was for, you know, since sort of 2020 when we opened our UK office, it was almost, I mean, it's not directly correlated, but you can kind of see the price of Bitcoin and our account, you know, account openings going up and then it coming down with the price of Bitcoin. Um, gets to about sort of December last year, January this year, the two lines just separate. An uncorrelated so, asset, there you go. Um, so inquiries, um, ad adoption, so what I mean is adoption and price have become yeah. uncorrelated, and that's, and that's good, right? That means that you've got people kind of exploring this, again, in a, in a mature way without worrying about the price too much, because at the, at the end of the day, you know, to my earlier point, you know, markets are volatile, prices are going to go up and down, and it doesn't mean you shouldn't explore the utility of, of, of an asset class because of that. Uh, I'm going to put it slightly differently to you, uh, Alan, um, uh, just because you, you guys don't service for Bitcoin uh, just yet, but you are the, experiencing the same very difficult market conditions. I read an article recently, I think it was in Forbes, and it was, I think it was quoting a trader who says, uh, we don't know what to do anymore. We don't know where to put money. How challenging is the environment now 
for investing. For yeah, you can hold on to cash, and you can be losing quoted 10% mm -hmm. due to inflation, probably higher. Um, most assets are dropping. Um, I personally, uh, uh, you know, I get paid in dollars, and I'm now starting to hold those do dollars rather than the pound because the pound mm -hmm. crashed. How challenging is this environment for you? So it's challenging, but it's nothing that we haven't seen before. So look. In the 1970s, when we last had a serious inflation problem, we did, for those in the UK, we did in the late 1980s have a quick blip to 10% inflation, the so-called uh, Nigel Lawson boom, not, not Nigella, uh, Nigel. Um, so uh, 1970s, what happened? Because uh, I know these numbers, US inflation averaged seven. UK was a bit higher, uh, and, and uh, gold was the place to be, you know, absolutely, in that period. But what did stocks do? 6% compound. It was a rocky 6% compound. Why? Because companies do ex exist in nominal GDP. I know there's a, it was, it's, it's, it's a GDP is a, it was a, has some controversy, but, but what do I mean by that? If I put it in really simple terms, uh, I think it was yesterday, Nestle announced price increases. So if you're a Nestle shareholder, you benefit from that. Not over and above inflation. Um, so uh, bring it back to fundamentals. It, it, I still think investing in companies makes perfect sense, absolutely, um, because you, you, can't, you, can't you can't change human behavior. We learned that from COVID, right? Uh, you know, we had deep depression, and people said, oh, it's never going to be the same. What happened? We had a huge V-shaped recovery, um, and people going out. Similarly, you can't change human behavior. The people running Nestle, Apple, et cetera, they, they are there to make the company better and get more profits. The, one of the easiest ways of doing that, if you can, is raise prices. It's not as great as a new Apple, Samsung product or, or, or whatever, but it's, it's, it's one way. And therefore, stocks can deliver in higher inflation environments. And, and finally, uh, while we're on the fiat world, stocks have a tendency to surge over short periods. We saw that in December 19. Five months, the first five months of December 19, US stocks were up 25%. So you get these surges. If crypto's down then, I might be interested, because <coughs> then it'll be uncorrelated into that scenario. We've got, to get, we've got to get you saying the word Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, OK. Um, James and Manuel, a question for you. Um, with regards to the people who are coming to you, it's probably a bit more for you, Manuel, but James, you might have an answer. Um, Bitcoin is something that people want to hold as an asset. They want to use it for a store of value. But also, increasingly, people want to start using it. Again, I'm just going to a case a point for me. I get paid by some people in Bitcoin, and in a couple of instances, it was the best way. I uh, paid a cameraman in Japan once because we couldn't get our bank accounts to link. Um, I get paid by sponsors sometimes, but just because just of the difficulty in using the banking system. Are you seeing a growth in people not only buying Bitcoin to store, but actually acquiring it because they need to use it within their business? If I'm honest, no. Okay. Um, I think it's because some of the, how, how you interact with it on a day-to-day -day basis still needs to develop or get into the mainstream. For example, what Coin Corner are doing, I mean, that sort of stuff is fantastic. And I think that will bring Bitcoin more into the everyday use case that I think it was always designed to be. Um, so the answer is no, but I think it's just because effectively the interface to do that is still developing. Is it different for Fidelity? Um, so, so, no, I, I think I, I agree with James in, in, in the, the core of the response, which is we, we don't see a lot of people wanting to use uh, Bitcoin in everyday sort of use. Um, one of the main reasons, though, is, is tax, um, frankly, right? Because in a lot of countries, not all, by the way, so there's good exceptions uh, around the world, but uh, in the US and the UK, uh, if you spend your Bitcoin, you're seen as sort of disposing of, a, of an investable asset, uh, and so you're meant to pay capital gains on it. And so from a, a financial sense, uh, for most of us, it would make very little sense because you then would have to go through all of your sort of coffee or meal transactions uh, and then, you know, and, and pay 20% of, of any gains that you might have had uh, on, your, on your Bitcoin as you dispose of it. So, so there's, there's tax reasons why it's actually not, not a great asset to use on a sort of day-to-day -day basis. Um, do you think there should be regulation to change that or do you think it is classed correctly as an asset? Um, I think there's advantages and disadvantages to, to each. Um, I, you know, I think having harmonized regulation would be very important, one, one way or the other, right? I think it's important to, for people to have the clarity of kind of what the asset is and how, how, to, you know, how to use it, how to, how to deal with it. Um, part of the you know, one challenge that we see 
uh, trying to operate a business that is that is global, and, and you know, Bitcoin is global by nature, right? Um, is is being able to operate in different jurisdictions with very very wildly different views on kind of what the asset is, how it's classified, and and so on and so forth. So, um, so I think as a company, what we look for. You know, we don't necessarily express a, a view on what's good or bad, right? But, but what's really good to have is, you know, one, clarity, and two, as much sort of harmony as, uh, if you will, as, as possible across different jurisdictions. So on that clarity side, uh, and I'll put this to each of you, um, what would you like to see happen? And, you know, there's a lot of people in this room who are Bitcoiners, yep. and uh, I've had a chat this morning with Jim talking about we could be doing a lot more in the UK and how we will support it. Um, Often you find with uh, politicians, they're often, often led by advisors and who maybe aren't particularly educated on the, how this asset works and what it is. So what kind of clarity is it you're looking for? And really as a call to action to the people in here, what do you think we could be doing or should be doing? Um, I, I can start, but I know, you know James and I will actually speak about, about this kind of thing the, the other day. So, so, so it, really, you know, it really would be good to have a regulatory regime like you have for sort of securities or, or, or cash um, that would allow, you know, that would allow portfolio managers, financial advisors, et cetera, to, you know, to, to know what their fiduciary responsibilities are uh, to, to their investors, right? Because at the moment, the, the problem is, you know, there's some regulation, in the UK in particular, right? Like the, the, the kind of uh, only regulation that really applies to, to, uh, to Bitcoin um, is it has to do with anti-money laundering and, and sort of know your customer type requirements, which is very important, by the way. Um, and, and it already gives institutions some... Uh, very, you, well, let, let's... Yeah. Very important. Let, let, explain why. I'm not going to argue yeah, yeah. with you. I'm just going to yeah. ask why, because uh, a lot of people uh, within this room might disagree. Mm -hmm. They might disagree with KYC rules, uh, anti-money laundering rules, because they, they actually bring risk to every single person in this room by exposing their data to nefarious actors. We often, I mean... Hands up if you've found out that your data has been stolen. Hands up if you haven't. That's probably easier. Yeah, so there's a website I could show you and you'll find out when it has been. I mean, everyone here. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, it's a rounding error saying they haven't been exposed to their data being stolen. So everybody in this room has been exposed to their data being sold, which could be logins to various websites. There's an increased risk with Bitcoiners because if, say, your addresses are exposed, uh, we know there are some kind of nefarious actors who might come to your house with a, a drill and uh, put that in your knee and say, give me a Bitcoin. So the KYC AML laws, I understand the government's argument, but it has introduced this new level of risk to other people. So why would you say it's important? Yes, I know. So, so if you think about um, our model, for example, actually that level of risk does, doesn't exist because we... Um, because you would only potentially get sort of fidelity addresses. If you use a custodian, we're kind of, uh, you know, we're, as I said, we're taking some of that operational risk for our client. Um, and so, you know, as long as we don't lose our, our client's data, that, the, the risk is fidelity could get hacked, right? Well, that, and, but that is the yeah. risk. That's the risk I'm talking about. We yeah. hear about all these different companies and institutions, they get hacked, their details Ab get sold out on the dark web. Absolutely, there is a risk. I think, look, it's... It, you always, you're always trying to, to do a little bit of a balancing act, right? And I was actually having a conversation with, um, uh, with someone the other day that hasn't got, so, so they use a third party custodian, but they also have some self custody because they're different types of risk. But the custodian who have some you know, regulatory risks, some political risk potentially, uh, or the risk that they lose your data or expose it in some way. Uh, but if you do self custody, then you're putting yourself at risk that somebody, you know, um, uh, robs your private keys somehow from your house or whatever you, you might keep them. So, so that you're always trying to balance the, the two. And again, like there's people that are kind of using both to try and you know to try and spread that that risk a little bit. So, so, uh, and undeniably, if you give your data to a company, obviously you're putting it more at risk than if you keep it yourself. Um, but I just finished kind of my earlier yeah. point. The so so the, the only piece in the UK is AML and NQIC, which again I, I think it's important to kind of give. You know, give institutions the, the, the confidence that they're not getting involved in, in any sort of nefarious activity. Um, but what is missing is, you know, if uh, in, in securities, for example, you have a lot of clarity, for example, around the treatment if you lend things, for example. If you lend Bitcoin uh, in the UK, it's, it's almost as if you'd, if, if, if the, the title is transferred, even if it's a loan behind it, it's like you've disposed of it, so you're going to pay tax on it. So, like, there's a lot of implications of things that have never seen, sort of been clarified that would allow Bitcoin to then be used a lot more 
uh, in, in a sort of lot more mainstream scenarios, such as payments, such as you know more complex sort of investment structures that, that you can't really get there unless the regulator you know sort of comes forward and, and puts a, puts a framework around I, it. I think it pretty it, it comes down to, to scale, right? So so people want to be able to be able to transact without all of that AML and KYC type stuff. So it, it is sort of the difference between you know you're gonna you're gonna put a lot of your assets, your pension or whatever, it's going to be with a custodian, but then you may have cash to transact. So I think the annoying bit of KYC and, and AML is at the small scale, it's probably so unimportant on protecting people. Um, so hopefully when, when crypto assets actually start being regulated properly, there's going to be a look at people that are holding it on a large scale, and there's probably requirements around that, but also understanding that people are using it every day. And actually, the having to get, have those sort of requirements on that sort of small level transaction, it probably isn't required, but the regulator is probably going to go to the, the, the bit where everybody has to give AML and K, KYC for everything. I'm getting a note, not from Joe. I think, we're, I think we've hit our time limit. Um, look, fantastic chat. I really appreciate uh, everything you brought to the table, James and Manuel and Alan. And Alan specifically, it's great to see Coots here. One thing I will say is, as uh, Coots have a growing interest, um, you will be able to get any support you want. Anybody who's involved in Bitcoin would uh, probably love to come and talk to you and give you any advice or any support. You'll find it a very welcoming community. Uh, can we have a round of applause? It's a great panel. Thank you.